Welcome to Complete Anatomy. My name is Dr. Alan Detton, and in this lecture, I'll be going over an introduction to anatomical position, planes, and terminology. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to define anatomical position, provide examples of why anatomical position and planes are clinically important, describe the difference between a systemic and regional approach to learning anatomy, correctly describe the orientation of anatomical planes and discuss their significance in diagnostic imaging, and properly use anatomical terminology to discuss relationships within a region of the body or within a system. As we begin our study of human anatomy, it is important to understand that you're essentially now learning a new language. And this language is going to help us better describe how parts of our body relate to one another or to better help us understand how different structures are named. So some of the different structures within the various systems of the body are going to have names that might at first seem confusing. However, if you understand that these are based on Latin or Greek origins and you know the name relates to some kind of a descriptive feature, that will help with our comprehension of how these different uh, structures were named and why we call them the things we do. Now, the language of anatomy we often call anatomical terminology. And one of the first concepts we need to understand is that the human body has sort of a default or a resting position that will help us better describe how the various parts or structures relate to one another. The first concept of anatomical position is that the body is standing erect or upright. And this will help us know that we're not sitting down or bent forward as we describe how things relate to one another. We can see that the head is directed towards the front of the body, as are the eyes. So our gaze is directed towards the front, and our head is straight forward. The upper limbs are going to be positioned down to the sides of the body in a relaxed orientation. They're not held close up against our side or spread out far apart, and we're not using any energy to keep them upright. The palms of our hands are directed anteriorly, which means to the front, and they're not rotated. So again, we don't have the palm of our hand facing towards our thigh or towards the back of our body. Lastly, the feet are approximately shoulder width apart with the toes directed to the front. So they're not going to be pigeon toed, we're not knock kneed, we're not having our feet splayed out to the sides with that too much orientation. So if we understand how the body is positioned in space, it will help us more accurately describe how the different component parts relate to one another. And we'll build on this terminology as we move forward. In order to accurately describe how the different structures in our body are related one to another, we often take advantage of anatomical planes. Now there are three cardinal or primary planes of our body, and these will be oriented in an X, Y, and Z type of orientation. Now some of the planes are going to be mobile and be adjustable, whether to the front or back or up or down throughout our body. The first of them, however, is going to only be located in one specific point, and that is the midline. So here, if I were to divide the body into equal right and left halves, I have drawn an approximate location of the median or mid-sagittal plane. So this plane is specifically located right in the middle of our body, and again would subdivide it into equal right and left halves. If I were to adjust that vertically oriented plane and put it in any vertical orientation away from midline, this is simply known as a sagittal plane. And what we see is this divides the body into unequal right and left components. The next type of plane would be located perpendicular to these two vertically oriented planes. And this would be known as an axial plane. Now an axial plane is going to have multiple names. And this is also known as a transverse or a horizontal plane of our body. 
And as we can see, it's going to be at a right angle to those vertically oriented median or mid-sagittal planes and any of the sagittal cuts throughout our body. Now, an axial plane could be at any height either above or below this point, so it doesn't have a specific location, but it means that it's in this point of reference, that it's horizontally oriented. So typically, if a physician ordered an MRI, this would be taken in a horizontal or axial plane. Now the last type of plane that we're going to see will be located at right angles or perpendicular to both of these other types of cuts or slices. And this would be known as a frontal or a coronal plane. And here we have now effectively divided the body into a portion in front of or behind that vertically oriented slice. This is known as anterior or posterior to that point of reference. So the three different cardinal planes, the frontal, median, and axial, are going to subdivide the body into different organizational points of reference. Now this might be used diagnostically or it might be used physically, where potentially a course is focused on looking at cross-sectional slices to better understand the different relationships of the different systems in our body. There are two common ways to teach human anatomy. We can either look at it systemically in a systems-based course or regionally in a regional type of course. In a systems-based course, we would look at how the different component pieces work together to serve a common function. For example, with the skeletal system, we would look at the bones and cartilage and connective tissue that helps to protect and support the different structures in our body. We could also similarly look at the muscular system and see how that interacts with those bones to produce movement. If we were looking at the cardiovascular system, we would be able to follow blood flow from our heart out through the arteries of our body and then return through the veins of our body. So we would look at all of the component pieces as a whole and see how that serves the common function. In a regional approach to human anatomy, we would be looking at how the different systems interplay one with another within that area. For example, here in the head and neck, we would begin components of the respiratory system as well as the digestive system. We could also see inside the skull, if I fade these structures here and turned on the nervous system, we could see the underlying relationships of the brain and cranial nerves with the bones in this area. So the idea with a regional approach is you look at the interplay between all of the different systems within that area of the body. Now often this is done in a dissection type of course or a more advanced course where you're starting to look at how our body behaves and acts with the different systems one with another. The trunk of the human body can be subdivided into regional spaces, which we are going to refer to as cavities. And there are two major cavities within this region. There's going to be a thoracic cavity located within the thoracic region of our body, and then more inferiorly located, an abdominopelvic cavity. Now each of these cavities can be further subdivided into different regions within that cavity. For example, within the thoracic cavity, we can further subdivide this into a centrally located mediastinum or a mediastinal cavity and a more laterally located pleural cavity to either side. Within the centrally located mediastinum, we're going to find the heart as the dominant content. However, we're also going to be able to subdivide this into smaller component pieces, which would include structures like the great vessels, the esophagus, and the trachea. So some of the structures that will need to come into the thorax will pass through an area known as the thoracic inlet or aperture. So this is how structures could get from our head and neck or upper limbs in and out of the thoracic cavity. The laterally located pleural cavities are predominantly going to contain the lungs. So our right pleural cavity would have the right lung, 
while the left would have the left lung. We're also going to have again the airways coming in and out for gas exchange and the blood vessels in this region as well. So the dominant feature is the lungs, but we're still going to have some other structures within the pleural cavities. The thoracic cavity is going to be located superior to the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the separation point between these is going to be the diaphragm. Now in order for structures to pass through the diaphragm, there are specific openings where these structures will pass from the thoracic to the abdominal cavity. The more inferiorly located abdominal pelvic cavity can also be further subdivided into an abdominal cavity, which is more superiorly located, and a pelvic cavity, which would be more inferiorly located. The abdominal cavity is predominantly going to hold the organs of digestion. So here we can see the major digestive organs, but also it's going to contain some of the accessory organs of digestion. The pelvic cavity, on the other hand, is going to contain some of the urogenital structures, like the bladder and some of the internal reproductive organs. So in the male, the prostate gland and seminal vesicles, while in the female, this would be the uterus and the vagina. We're also going to have the distal or terminal ends of the digestive tract located down within the pelvis, so the rectum and the anus. Now the pelvic cavity is going to be bounded inferiorly by the muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. So you could see that without these muscles, there's just going to be a large opening positioned inferiorly. So these are going to not only help provide resistance, but they're going to help support some of the contents within the pelvic cavity. The superiorly, or the superior boundary, of the pelvic cavity and what's going to separate it from the abdominal cavity is known as the pelvic brim or the pelvic inlet. And this is a solid ring of skeletal tissue or bones that are going to surround this barrier. So we're going to have a very distinct ring separating the abdominal and pelvic cavities, but it is not going to block off the passage so that the structures from the abdomen can enter or leave the pelvic cavity. Within the major body cavities, we're going to have a special type of lining known as a serous membrane. The serous membrane is going to consist of two different layers, a layer against the wall of the cavity and a layer on the surface of the organ itself. Now the idea behind having two layers is we want to reduce friction for organs that move a lot. For example, if I were to remove the lungs here in the thoracic cavity and give us a better view of the heart, the heart needs to beat all day every day and we do not want to have a lot of excessive friction between the heart and the surrounding structures as it beats throughout your life. That would increase wear and tear and likely lead to a lot of damage to the tissue of the heart itself. Now the idea behind a serous membrane can best be explained perhaps by looking at a simple drawing of a balloon. Here I've drawn the balloon which has one layer of thickness surrounding an inner cavity. In this case the cavity might be filled with air or even potentially water, but it is airtight, meaning that there's not going to be a way for that air or fluid to leave that inner cavity. Let's say hypothetically you were to shove your fist down into that balloon. What you've now done is created two layers out of what was once a single layer. You have a layer tight up against the surface of the fist and an outer layer that is separated from that inner layer by a cavity that could be filled with either air or some form of liquid material. We also have a gap that would allow for passage of structures in and out of that inner aspect. In this case, our wrist containing the arteries and tendons and structures that are important to make our hand move can freely come in and out of this gap without penetrating through the actual lining of the balloon, 
which would cause air or fluid to leak. This is the same concept with our key organs. Now, around the heart and the lungs, we're going to want to have structures pass in and out of that organ, but we want to have an area that would allow for movement in an essentially frictionless environment. You could slightly squeeze and expand your hand, and it would not really affect the outer lining of this structure. Reality is that we're going to have two different layers, so we need to be able to name them depending on their location. The outer layer is known as the parietal layer, and the inner layer that would have surrounded the fist, or in this case one of these organs, is known as the visceral layer, with viscera meaning organ. Each serous membrane is going to have two descriptive terms. The first describes is it on the wall or on the organ itself. The second term is going to tell us of which cavity. So we're going to have a pleural cavity surrounding the lungs, a pericardial cavity surrounding the heart, and a peritoneal cavity surrounding the abdominal organs. By combining these terms, parietal or visceral, with either pleural, pericardial, or peritoneal, we get a distinct description of which layer we're looking at. For example, the parietal pleura is going to be the layer lining the walls of the pleural cavity, whereas the visceral pleura is the layer lining the actual surface of the lung itself. The visceral pericardium is the layer lining the actual surface of the heart, and this would be continuous with the inner aspect of a structure known as the pericardial sac, which is lined by the parietal pericardium layer. Lastly, visceral peritoneum would then line an organ within the abdominal cavity. And we can see by zooming in that there's going to be a thin reflective layer on the surface of the stomach, as well as on the liver, the gallbladder, or the large and small intestine, which are also highly mobile organs within the abdominal cavity. A major component of anatomical terminology are terms of relationship, often described as directional terms. And some of these are going to be found in pairs. Now, the terms could either be used as a pair with one term relating to another or used independently in some cases. And the idea is that these directional terms or terms of relationship will better help us relate one structure in the body to another. For example, if we were to look at the terms superficial versus deep, we would describe structures that are located closer towards the skin or the surface of our body as being superficial, while those that are directed or further away from the skin are going to be termed deep. So we're going to see that we will have some structures that are going to be more deeply located and some that are more superficially located. A good example of this is the venous system, where we're going to have some veins that are going to be more superficially located and course through the just hypodermis or subcutaneous tissue, while we're also going to have some deep veins that are going to course deeper to other structures. We could also simply describe these structures in relation to one another with these terms. So I could describe the muscles of the arm as being located superficial to the underlying bone, or I could describe the bone as being deep to the overlying muscles. So the terms are going to be helpful for identification and relationship of one thing to another within the body. Another example of this are the terms anterior or ventral and posterior or dorsal. The anterior or ventral surface of an organ or the body is towards the front, while the posterior or dorsal is towards the back. And you can help remember the term dorsal or back by thinking of the dorsal fin of a dolphin or a fish, which is located along the back of that animal. So the posterior surface or anterior surfaces could also describe an individual organ or a compartment within a region of the body. For example, there are muscles more anteriorly located 
and those more posteriorly located. We can also describe structures as either being superior or cranial and inferior or caudal. Cranial means the head, while caudal means the tail. So structures that are more superior are closer towards the top of our head, while structures that are more inferior are further away from the top of our head or closer towards the tail, or you could think of it in us as towards the soles of our feet. Now we could describe the eyes as being superior to the oral cavity, or I could describe the chin as being inferior to the oral cavity. The terms superior and inferior often are going to be applied to the trunk or the structures within the midline of our body, also including the head and the neck. While in the limbs, we might use directional terms of proximal and distal. A proximal structure would be closer towards the point of origin, while distal is further from that point of origin. So we could describe the elbow as being either proximal to the wrist or the shoulder as being proximal to the elbow. Or we could describe the wrist as being distal to the elbow. We could also use these terms proximal and distal with some of the hollow organs of our body, like those found in our digestive tract, where the stomach would have a proximal end and a distal end, as would the small intestine and the large intestine. So the points being closest to its point of origin would be proximally located, while the distal is further from that point of origin. The last terms I'd like to describe are related to the midline axis, and these are going to be the terms lateral and medial. In anatomical position, I would describe our thumb as being lateral to the little finger or the pinky, which would be more medially located. And this will be helpful as we look at some of the large structures in our body where they may have in their name the terms medial, or lateral, again in reference to the mid-sagittal plane in the midline of our body. Another subset of anatomical terms are terms of laterality. Now terms of laterality are going to be used to describe how a organ or a structure is related either to itself or to other things, but it's used in isolation. And what I mean by this is it's different than the directional terms of relationship we looked at before, which would describe something as being perhaps superficial or deep to another similar structure, or it could be medial versus lateral, or superior and inferior, so terms that come in pairs. If I were to use terms of laterality, they can be used in isolation. For example, if I looked at a muscle in my right thigh, the right rectus femoris, and I described this as a bilateral structure. What that tells me is that there's going to be a mirror image of that structure on the opposite side of the body. So the right rectus femoris is going to be a muscle that helps me flex my hip and extend my right knee. It's going to have the exact same structure on the opposite side of the body with the same name serving the same function. So the left rectus femoris would flex my left hip and extend my left knee. If I were to describe a structure as a unilateral structure, it does not have a pair, meaning it's unpaired and typically found only on one side of the body. A unilateral structure could be like our digestive organs, which would be only found on one side. So my stomach is only going to be by itself. I don't have a right and a left stomach. Similarly, I would have a liver and a gallbladder. These are considered unilateral structures, but they don't have a counterpart on the opposite side of the body. I don't have a right and a left gallbladder, for example. Now, if I were to describe structures as being different structures on opposite sides of the body, I would describe them as being contralateral to one another. For example, my salivary glands, I would have a right parotid gland on my right cheek and under my jaw, a contralaterally located left submandibular gland. 
Now, just because a structure is contralateral to something else doesn't mean it couldn't also be bilaterally located. So my salivary glands will have a counterpart on the opposite side, so they could be bilateral. However, if I'm describing different structures on opposite sides of the body, I would call them contralateral to one another. If I'm comparing different structures, but on the same side of the body, I would refer to them as being ipsilateral. For example, I might make comparisons to my left hand and my left foot. They are different structures, but they are on the same side of the body, so they would be considered ipsilateral. In more detail, I could describe my left thumb with my left index finger, or my left thumb and my left big toe, and call them ipsilateral to one another. So these terms are going to simply describe relationships but not be paired like the terms of relationship before, these are now terms of laterality.